Lord, we come before you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy that follows us, Lord, your grace that is extended toward us. And Lord, as we uh, now take time and dive into your word, we pray that you would just speak through it and that you would be glorified this morning in the church said. Amen. Amen, Amen church. Well, uh, good news. Phil and Cindy made it back from Arizona safe. And bad news, they got sick. So you got me again. Extend grace. We're going to pick it up where we left off last week in Philippians chapter 4. We're just going to continue and finish out the chapter. Last week we went through verses 1 through 9. This week we're going to go through verses 10 through 23 in a message titled, Our Greatest Need. And as you're opening there to Philippians 4, in way of recap of last week, we saw that in the first nine verses, it's dealing with joy. This whole chapter here deals with joy, joy in giving in the Christian life. And we saw that we could give to the Lord through prayer the things that are concerning us, the trials, the cares of this life, the things that are weighing us down, whatever it may be, uh, day in and day out. If we give those to the Lord in prayer, we are given a return of what? Peace, joy, right? And so that return of peace and that return of joy comes to us, and it's a peace and it's a joy that surpasses all understanding. But even more so than that, it also guards our hearts and minds, like it says there in those last verses of the first section here. So that brings us to verse 10 of chapter 4, where Paul continues this idea of joy through giving. Changes gears a little bit here. That's why it's broken up, and the giving is now us giving not necessarily to the Lord, but to others via giving to the Lord via others, right? Does that make sense? If not, good, because we're going to talk about it. And all of that, we've got to remember, is under the context. We went over that last section of chapter 3 where the context was that our citizenship was in heaven, right? And so we look towards heaven. We look through forward to the things of come, or the things to come, and knowing that no matter what goes on in this earth that is temporary and that we are looking towards heaven. So let's, uh, let's open up, read verses 10 through 23 together. It says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, now that at, le- at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now that I speak in regard, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, verse 14, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving or receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid, once again, for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all, and I I abound. I am full, having received from Epaphrodites the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus." Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 21, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So, like I said, Paul's going to continue here talking about this concept of giving as the Christian is supposed to give. And he talks about in verse 10 through 13, 23 giving to others and we can all agree that it's important to give right it's important to help and it's important to minister to others and to the church and it's it should bring great joy to our hearts because that's what paul says it does here and this is what paul wants to deal with and if you're taking notes or you want to outline today's study we're going to look at eight different things pertaining to giving to others that we see in these verses laid out The first one is going to be in verse 10. And the first thing we learn about giving to others is that it involves opportunity, right? So look again with me, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly now that at least your care for me had flourished again. 
though you surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. So right off the bat, Paul was a hard guy to keep track of, right? They didn't have modern technology, no cell phones, no GPS. They didn't have a tracker stuck on him. He didn't have an ankle bracelet. He was a hard guy to keep track of. He was going from country to country or state to state. He was moving around, spreading the gospel all throughout. And so the church had a hard time. But we know from last week, we looked at Paul's writing this letter from where? Prison. He's in a Roman prison. He's chained down. Easy to find, right? They got him on lock and key, so they know where he's at. So there's the opportunity that the church in Philippi had. They have opportunity. According to verse 18, the church in Philippi did what they were supposed to do. It says in verse 18, Indeed, I have all and I abound. I am full because of what I received from Epaphrodites from you a sweet-smelling aroma, acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So now that the church there had the opportunity, they were able to have joy as a body in Christ by giving to Paul. And the application straight out the gate is simple for us. And that's that hopefully as Christians we're looking forward and we're looking out for those doors that God loves to open in order for us to give or to minister to other people. Because in return we get joy in doing so right it's it, it, it can feel like do you ever feel like at your job that it's it could hinder you from being able to be effective for the lord like ah, i gotta go my go to my job like I, I those pastors have it set you know they get to be on staff full time and they don't have to do anything all week they just get to go witness to whoever they want well i was on staff at a church full time years ago and i'll tell you what it was annoying because I would walk around the office there and everybody knew Jesus. There was no point in sharing the gospel there. It was hard, right? I'd walk down the hall and be like, ah, you know, Je this is a pastor. He knows Jesus. Uh, what about you? Uh, secretary, she knows Jesus. Everybody there was saved. So it wasn't, there wasn't that giving of the gospel, but there was at that job, at that time, the giving of ministering and counseling and people that would come in from the church body throughout the week. And there was open doors from the Lord. Now I don't have that job. Now I serve this church, but I work a full-time job, and I dig holes for a living. That's what I do, and I shoot lines underground. There is tons of opportunity in my field in the pipeline industry to spread the gospel. And that's the opportunity that Paul's talking about here. We need to look at our jobs as not this thing that we have to do so that we can live the American dream and provide for our families the way we want to provide and have the things that we want to have and live lavishly or whatever. Our jobs, they put food on our tables, clothes on our backs, and the Lord has given it to us to give us shelter, right? That's why we have our jobs, take care of our family. But it's also an opportunity to share the gospel. A lot of people, the world is the tense right now. Do you feel it? <laughs> it's tense in the world. And there's a lot going on. And we have the opportunity to spread light and to spread love at our job and our workplace that even now the littlest flame looks bigger than ever because the world is so dark right now we have opportunities at our jobs so the opportunity at the church to give the gospel wasn't apparent but it is now the reality is that no matter where you're at whatever job you have it's an opportunity to be able to give to others the joy of the gospel and in return you receive joy so that's the first thing. We see an opportunity in, in giving. The second thing we see in verses 11 and 12 in light of giving to others is contentment. We're going to look again at verse 11 and 12. It says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be, what? Content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So Paul here, remember he was in Rome. He was in a Roman prison. He was in a bad state, we could call it, right? You guys know what I mean about a bad state? You live in Illinois. It's a bad state, okay? I think we can all agree that there's some stuff going on here that's not good. And we think, like, we think like that, right? We don't think like Paul all the time. We think, man, if I could just get out of Illinois. Like, people leave this state in droves. They're leaving California in droves. 
if I could just get to Florida or I get to Texas or Arizona or Colorado, basically anything that's not as cold or feels like an Iraqi war zone, that would be awesome, right? The reality could be nothing further from the truth, though, is that when you leave, the problem is that you take you with you. And if you're not content in whatever state you're in, you're going to get to that place and be not content. No, Paul learned to be content in whatever state he was in. And he was in a bad state. Look at verse 12 again. It says, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I have learned both to be full, hungry, to abound, and to suffer need. He said, I'm content. I'm content in Christ. No matter where I am, no matter what I have or what I don't have, I'm totally content. But the key here is something that we need to bring to light. And it's that word that's shown there twice, once in 11 and once in verse 12. He says, we learn, right? It says there, I have learned in whatever state I am, in verse 11, and then in 12, in all things, I have learned. So we see that we need to learn to be content. It's a conscience decision, right? We learn to be content through go, by going through things that would make us not be content. It's kind of like when you understand what it is to be content in who Christ is, you begin to understand why at certain points in our lives God gives us a lot and God gives us a little. You know what I mean? Like at some points financially you're set and at other points you're not. At some points you're sick and some points you're not. You get the picture, right? There's ups and downs. There's there's different there's mountain peaks and there's valleys to our walks and you might ask why does God allow these big ebbs and flows throughout our lives and it's to teach us it's simple he does it to teach us to teach us that our contentment is not based in our situations or in our physical wellness or in our financial state but rather our contentment is to be solely based in Jesus Christ and him alone when we look to him as the author and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2, we're going to be content in whatever state we're in, whether we have it all or we have nothing. So having joy in giving to others requires contentment. That leads us to the third thing we see, and that's going to be in verse 13, and that is confidence. Having joy in giving to others requires confidence. Look again. Well, actually, don't, because you know it, right? Everybody knows this verse. I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. That speaks of confidence, doesn't it? The confidence in that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have joy in giving to others, whether we have a lot or we have nothing at all. Why? Because our confidence is based in Jesus Christ and in the fact that he's going to strengthen us. Listen, because when we're relying on his strength and his supremacy and his sufficiency, the fact is that, remember what Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for, here's the key, without me you can do nothing. But in, through, and because of Jesus, we can do all things in accordance to his will because he is our strength, church. We don't look to our own power we don't look to our own finances. We don't look to our own strength. Remember Zechariah 4, 6 says, the word, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by my might, or not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's funny, this verse is probably one of the uh, most known, right? Everybody knows this verse. People get it. They ride it everywhere. They put it on little things in their home and hang them. I, I got a guy at work that has it tattooed on his arm. I had no idea he had any inkling to anything to do with God or the church or anything until I seen that. And that was like we talked about earlier, our jobs are an opportunity. That was my in because I happen to have a tattoo on my arm in the same spot he has that Bible verse tattooed on his arm. So that was my talking point to him. That was my door. I'm like, hey, dude, you got, what is that, uh, do you know, what does that mean? 
in the Philippians 4.13. And he didn't put it together that I was saved. Like, he, d- he just thought I was asking, what does Philippians 4.13 mean? And he said, oh, you know, it means I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm like, what does that mean? And he's like, I could do anything. Like, whatever I need to do, whatever I need to get done, whatever I need to do to provide for my family, whatever, whatever I got to do, I can get it done because Christ strengthens me to do it. Whatever I want, whatever I need, I can get it. And I'm like, that's, that's cool, dude. But that's also definitely not what that verse means. And he's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian too. I said, but do you know that that verse, you know, and I, I just got to talk to him about, hey, that whole verse is talking about confidence and contentment and who Jesus is based off the fact that we are, um, we have citizenship in heaven and our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life and we look forward to those things. And, and that whole the whole process there behind that verse is talking about what the Lord is calling you to do. I like the way that uh, the Living Bible puts it, puts it into some plain English that I was able to tell to him. And it says, I, I can do everything God asked me to do with the help of Christ who gives me the strength to do it, the strength and power to do it. Doesn't that kind of bring it home? Makes it have a little bit more sense. We rely on the Lord's Spirit to come upon us, strengthen us, and overflow us. When we do that, we're going to be confident in the way that we give to others, whether we have a lot or we have a little. So our joy in giving to others involves a confidence in Christ. That brings us to the fourth thing we're going to look at, and that is sharing. And that's in verses 14 through 16. We're going to look at them again. In verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. So the the Philippians here, they were sharing two things with Paul. The first thing they shared was in uh, verse 14, and we see it's distress, right? They shared in my distress or in my trouble or in my opposition. And what does that mean? It it can mean that either they they partook in Paul's um, distress or in his troubles literally, like they knew exactly what he was going through because they went through something like that themselves, like they were imprisoned or beat or something for sharing the gospel, Or it could carry the idea that they're just simply empathetic to what he's going through. And the fact of the matter is that it doesn't matter whichever way you want to view that. The important thing to take away from this is that they understood what Paul was going through. And that application for us today is simple. Paul knew he wasn't alone. And that should encourage you today. We can have, they had great joy, the church in in Philippi, knowing that in giving to Paul, because they understood his distress by either going through it themselves or empathizing with it. Either way, Paul knew he wasn't alone. And what a great comfort that should bring to us as Christians, because no matter what we're going through or no matter what we're dealing with, uh, no matter what burden is coming upon us, chances are somebody else in the body has gone through that. And so as you have gone through these trials and you see somebody else coming up on the same kind of thing, you're called to help. You're called to give in whatever way the Lord calls you to. Maybe you need to counsel that person, encourage that person, love on that person, pray for that person, whatever it is. And the other thing that's awesome here is that we have the Spirit of God. Because if, say, say, say you're going through something that nobody can understand, you have the spirit that can sympathize with you. He comes alongside us. He is our comforter, right? And that should bring us joy. You can take it a step further. This doesn't just deal with the fact that we aren't alone because we're brothers and sisters in Christ and we're a body, but it also carries the idea that we aren't alone because God is always with us and he's always for us. He understands. He went through it. Remember what it says in Hebrews 4.15. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. 
but was in all points tempted and yet without sin. So he knows what you're going through and he understands it. He knows what you're dealing with. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And even God himself said in Hebrews 13, verse 5, Be content with such things as you have, for he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The fact that the creator of life, church, the one who made, every, made everything, is never going to leave you should bless you like crazy. If everything else crumbles, that should be something you stand on. He's got you, and he ain't leaving. Put your trust in him. So the first thing we saw there is that they shared in his distress in verse 14, but the next thing we see in verse 15 and 16 is that they shared in his aid. Read it again with me. It says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning uh, concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Verse 16, here it is. For even in Thessalonica you sent, what? Aid. Once and again for my necessities. So the Philippians shared their wealth with Paul to further the ministry of Paul, which was what? What was Paul doing? Sharing the gospel, right? That was his whole thing. Real basic. It got weird because he was, it was crazy. It was a crazy ministry, but that was it. I'm, he, I'm just sharing the gospel. That's all I'm doing. And so the church there in Philippi, they shared of their wealth to, to help to further that. And it says that Paul received necessities from the church so that he could continue in the work that God called him to do. And the application here is pretty easy. And we can apply it in two different ways. First, the first way we can apply it is to our lives as individuals, right? Or as individual families. Because the reality is, is we should share or give to the ministry that ministers to us. Wherever you're growing and maturing spiritually, wherever you're being fed the word uh, practically, that's the ministry that you should be supporting in everything, in the gifts that God's given you financially, whatever it is. That's where we should support and that's what you should get behind. I don't care if it's a radio program, if it's a podcast, if it's like Destiny Rescue, what we support as a church, whatever it is, what, or if it's here at Calvary, wherever you're being ministered to, that's where you need to minister back to. And that shows maturity. And when we do, the key to all that is that we need to make sure we have the right heart. It says in 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 7, So let, let each one of you give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So we aren't to give sadly or madly, but we're to give gladly, right, church? And if we give cheerfully or with the right heart, then we shouldn't, if we can't do that, then we shouldn't be giving at all. Because the truth of the matter is that God doesn't want it, and he doesn't need it. The benefit isn't for him. I, I remember being asked I, more than once, for sure, from people in the church, well, how much am I supposed to give? And I don't know. There's no number. There's no, you know, a lot of people say, oh, 10%. And I'm like, 10%? That means 90 goes back to you. That's crazy. You know what I mean? Whatever the Lord calls you to do, that's what he calls you to do. So that's the answer. I remember Pastor Chuck used to say, it's not how much do I give to the Lord, but how much do I dare hold back for myself? Well, when you put it like that, Chuck, that puts it into perspective, you know? See, the issue is that we think what we have in the first place is ours. That's the problem. And it's, it's speaking of the heart. It's not a number problem. It's a hard thing. I'm, when my son, my two and a half year old, Caden, he loves, he loves balls. He loves throwing balls, football, baseball, basketball, whatever it is. He loves it. 
and he'll have two of them, you know, and I'll be like, hey, dude, give me give me one of those. Let's play. And he'll just kind of give me the side eye, like, nah, these are mine. You know what I mean? And I'm like, dude, we got to share, man. Tries to trying to teach a two-year-old to share, right? Doesn't come naturally. It's not really a ton of fun. And he's like, no, these are mine. I'm like, yeah, but you got to share, dude. No, it's mine. No, it's mine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But the reality is, is that like that, we can sometimes get in the mentality of a two-year-old thinking, what I have is mine. We think everything is ours. The truth of the matter is that everything we have came from God, so subsequently it belongs to God. It says in Psalms 24.1, we read it this morning, the earth is the Lord's and its fullness to those who dwell therein. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 talks about the fact that we were bought with a price. So even we and of ourselves are not our own. We belong to God. So it's not how much do I give God, but it's how much do I hold back from him for myself. Individually, and I'm not, I'm not saying this, okay, I told Pete, we talked about last week, and I said, I stopped at verse 9 for two reasons last week. One, because of time, and two, because I don't want to talk about money. It's uncomfortable, right? And my dad always said something growing up, and he said, people get funny when it comes to money because it shows where their heart is. A lot of people, that's everything to them, most people. And it's sad as Christians that we can't talk about it and be encouraged and exhorted and matured in those things. We love to hear about anything else, but when it comes to that, so I was not feeling it. And then Phil go, tells me, hey, I'm sick. I need you to teach Sunday. And I go, back-to-back -back weeks, how am I not going to continue in that chapter? <sighs> All right, Lord. So he's stretching me too. The second way we look at giving is corporately. So first, we look at it individually, but secondly, corporately. As a church, corporately, we take off a, a percentage off the top from the ties that come in every week. Before the bills are paid, before the salaries are paid, before um, budgets are made, we take off the top, no matter what comes in, and we give to missions work and outreaches, and that's, that's what we're supposed to do as a church. As a body, we give back too, like the Destiny Rescue. T-shirts need to get paid for to get made for that walk. The flyers, we got a time booking the, the venue, stuff like that. And the whole purpose is to raise money. Every dime we get from that goes directly to helping rescue kids out of the sex slave industry. Think that's important? Yeah. But I look out at this room and I'm not seeing a lot of ex-military age males here that want to go on secret ops getting shot at rescuing kids you're not called to that right that's a select thing but we need to help in that so that's what we do as a body we support that ministry we support that that culture around that and that's our mindset here as a church corporately as a body that's our heart that's our mindset and that's our ideology that we understand that everything that comes in belongs to god anyways and so we want to use it to bring glory to God. That brings us to the fifth thing we see, and that's that giving to others involves a benefit. How cool is that? Look at verse 17 with me. It says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. So when they were giving to Paul, when they were giving Paul money and aid to further his ministry, it wasn't for Paul. It was for their benefit doesn't that kind of seem weird at first you read that and it's especially from the guy that's writing it he's the one who received it and he's like it could kind of sound i don't know if you think the way i do sometimes you're always on guard you know what i mean so i if if you were to give i think maybe i think this way because all the televangelists that constantly beg for money but oh no it's good for you keep giving oh give to me yeah, it's not for me, it's for you. That's the way I can almost take it. But we back it up with scripture. That's what's cool about this. Because he says, hey, the real gift, it's not about me. It's not about me receiving money. It's not about receiving aid from you. It's not about Paul. It's about Jesus. And it says in Matthew 6.20 that 
we need to lay up our treasure in heaven. And that's, that's the same thing that Paul means, different verbiage, by fruit abounding to our account. So when we give to others and when we give to the Lord and we give to ministries, that's fruit abounding to our account. It's not for, it benefits, but it also benefits us, right? And this is important for two different reasons. The first reason this is important, this benefit, is that the motive behind any church or any pastor talking about money should not be to benefit the church. It should be to benefit the people, the ones who are giving, so that fruit will abound to our account. It's gross when you think about it, how many so-called pastors um, beg for money and talk about money every week. Like it's like somehow if you don't give, the Lord's just going to crumble. Like, he, the, hey, you know what, guys? God overextended himself this week with my Bentley. And so we got to raise more money. Are you kidding me? Does he not own the cattle on a thousand hills? He's going to be fine. I've heard the pastors through the years. If, you know, the Lord needs your money. The church needs your money. The minist this ministry needs your money. Really? Nah, he doesn't. He doesn't. And he doesn't want you under compulsion to do it either. It's, it's a sad way that they um, make the Lord look to the world. I've heard so many people that aren't safe say, when you're witnessing to them, oh, they, all they care about is money. And how could they not think that when they turn on their TV and, or their radio and that's all they talk about? Or these radio stations, I'm sorry, I'm going to not step on this soapbox, but for more than two seconds... I cannot stand how Christian radio constantly pedal. Sell your airtime. Quit stealing the money. These guys live lavishly, and they act like they're not, oh, we're not, we got to stay on the air. Dude, is this not, you call it a ministry. If it's a ministry, then you'll be fine. Can't stand it. Anyways, I'm going to jump off that soapbox. I remember one time on a, one of the televangelists, he came on. Like, they're always asking for money for their new jets so they can get around the world faster. Like, if Paul wasn't like, I need four chariots, the best, the best Cadillac chariots so I can get around the world, spread the gospel. Like, what are you talking about? But there was this pastor that came on TV and he said, God told me if I don't raise $5 million today, he's going to take me home. And I was like, oh, have a good trip, click. <laughs> like, good. He should because you're bothering people. The truth of the matter is that God doesn't need us, and he doesn't need anything from us. But when we give to him, there's a benefit, church. And there's a blessing. And that brings us into the second aspect of that, which is the principle of being blessed when we are a blessing. When we give, we get. Now, I'm not talking about health and wealth or prosperity teaching or prosperity doctrine not a name it and claim it or a blab it and grab it type thing i'm not talking about that i'm talking about a basic biblical principle that is all throughout that when we give we get it says in luke 18 29 so he said to them assuredly i say to you there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. And then in Luke 6:38 Jesus said, "Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over to be put into your bosom." So clearly there is a principle in scripture that when we give, we get, right? However, the caveat to that is that we don't give in the hopes of getting. That's the important part. Because we need to have the right motive. It shows the heart. It reflects the heart, right? We need to have the right motive. When you give with the hopes of getting back, the Lord's not going to bless it. When you do give, and you just want to give because you've been given to by the Lord, and there's no motive that is wrong behind it, that's when the Lord looks at you and he goes right on. 
Now I'm going to bless you. And now I'm going to give back to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And the reason I'm going to bless you and the reason I'm going to give back to you is because you didn't want it in the first place. And you're going to take it and what I bless you with, you're going to keep giving it. And you're going to give back to others and you're going to whatever. I'm giving you a gift. The gift of encouragement. If you have that gift, that's what you're called to give. Whatever your gift is, whatever the Lord's blessed you with, give it. The sixth thing we see is going to be laid out in verse 18, and that's going to be that giving to others involves a sacrifice. Look at it again with me. It says, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphrodites the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. This is really significant. And the reason this verse is significant is because Paul's here in prison, and yet he says, hey, it's all good. I'm good. I have everything I need. I'm full, in fact. I'm abounding. I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I'm in the Lord's will. I'm right where he wants me. Totally content. I'm, I'm content. But the second aspect of that involves sacrifice right what the church did for paul while he was in prison was an acceptable sacrifice in other words they gave to paul sacrificially and what an important point that is for us because we can all agree that giving out of our abundance is super easy right church if you think man well hey i got this extra money i got this extra time i got this extra material i just give it to the church i'll give it to the lord i'll give it to this guy i'll give it to that Listen, I'm not knocking that. It's good to give. If your first thought when you have extra is, hey, I want to give it, then good. Praise the Lord. But that's not what it's talking about when it says a sacrificial giving. We need to give sacrificially. If it doesn't cost, it's not sacrificial giving. Remember when Jesus was at the Temple Mount in uh, Luke chapter 21, and he looked out and he's sitting there, and he sees people, the, all the rich people just coming in and, and just lavishly throwing on all of this money into the offering and all this gold and all these things and making almost a show of it. And then he looks out and he sees a widow who comes with two mites, two copper coins, virtually worthless. And he, she puts them in. And Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, Truly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all for all of these gave out of their abundance their offerings to God but she out of her poverty put all livelihood that she had it didn't cost the rich people anything to give what they gave and that was Jesus' point here but it cost that widow her livelihood to give it to God and that's why she gave more it wasn't about the the weight of the gold or the amount of the money it was about her giving sacrificially David also understood that principle in 2 Samuel 24 remember that when David he, he numbered the people and God was mad because he wasn't supposed to do that and so God sent a plague and subsequently David got right with the Lord and so he travels to Jebus which is Jerusalem, modern day, it's before it was called Jerusalem. It was Jebus. He travels there and he comes up and he sees Aruna and he's on his threshing floor and he looks at Aruna. Or Aruna looks at him and says, David, what can I do for you? And David says, I need to sacrifice to the Lord. And Aruna says, All right, dude, threshing floor is yours, free of charge. I got wood, I got oxen, sacrifice to the Lord. This is cool. What David says here, it's amazing. He says in verse 24 of 2 Samuel 24, No, I will surely buy it from you at a price, though. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord that cost me nothing. The big picture here, church, get this, is if it wasn't a sacrifice to David, he knew that it wasn't going to be accepted by the Lord. 
So for us today, we have joy. There is great joy in giving to others and in giving to the Lord when it's sacrificial. And that's the example Paul is setting here for us. It was a sacrifice for him to be in that prison. But remember the context of the end of chapter 3? And the context there is that he had joy because his citizenship was in heaven. So though it's a sacrifice temp temporarily, overall, it's not. That's why we look towards heaven. And that brings us to the, the seventh uh, thing that we see that pertains to giving to others, and that is there was a need. And that's going to be in verses 19 through 20. Look again with me. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So God will provide anything we need. Here's the key, according to his will, right? Church, is God rich in glory? Yeah, he is, no doubt. So is he going to provide for all of our need according to his riches? Absolutely. We know it to be true. And if you've walked with the Lord for any short amount of time, you know that to be true. But there's something important there that we got to note in those verses, and that's the word need. It says that he's going to provide for all our need, not all of our greed, right? He's going to give us what we need, not necessarily what we want. And we also got to make note of the fact that that word there is just four letters. It's singular, the word need. It doesn't say he's going to provide for all of our need, plural, needs, right? It's singular. So that word need, if you want to extrapolate that, we can look at it two different ways. The first way we can view that is that Paul is saying, in light of our greatest need, which is what? Jesus, exactly. God's going to provide for our greatest need, and he did. He gave Jesus to all of mankind because that's our greatest need, and that's all we really need. If everything were to go away but we have Jesus, that's it. I love that song that Amber sang today, Lord, I need you every hour, right? My one defense, my righteousness, oh, how I need you. The second way we can view that is that God is going to provide for our immediate need. And that's often the way the Lord likes to work. My mom used to say growing up, the Lord is ne God is rarely early, but he's never late. I love it. And I hated it. Because when you start walking by faith and you start trying to walk um, according to the word, that's so frustrating. It's like, I would just assume that God be super early with everything. Give me an account here so I know what I can draw from, right? That's not the way the Lord works. Why? Because he's teaching us to walk by faith. He wants us to walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. He wants us to trust him, right? He wants us to rely on him. That's why he's going to meet our greatest need at that moment in time. Remember in Exodus chapter 3, it's, this is illustrated beautifully. Moses was there and he left Egypt, right? And he went out after killing that Egyptian. He fled to the wilderness at Midian. And there, that's, he, he needed a job. He, he met Jethro. He ended up marrying his daughter, and he became a sheep herder for 40 years in the wilderness there. And one day he's just doing his Moses thing, and he's working, and he looks, and he sees a bush on fire. But it's not burning. It's not consumed, it says. So he was, goes to look at the bush. He's checking it out, and all of a sudden a voice, and it's the voice of God, comes from the bush, and it says, Moses, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. And then God begins to speak to Moses. And God said, Mo, listen. I want you to go back to Egypt, and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And after a bunch of back and forth between Moses, he was, he was, he was opposing it a little bit. He says, okay, God. He acquiesced, and he says, I'll go. And then he turns, and he says, oh, you know, by the way, God, who should I say sent me? Or in what other words, what's your name? And in Exodus 3, verse 14, God tells Moses his name. 
And he says, you tell Pharaoh, I am sent you. So now we know God's name, which is awesome because his name is not a noun, church. I am. It is a verb. Hello? <laughs> a verb is an action word, guys. It's a verb. That should bless you. God is saying, hey, I am. Whatever you need me to be, I am at that time. I'll be your strength. I am. I'll be your salvation. He is. I'll be your provider. He does. I will be your sustainer. I'll be whatever I am, whatever you need at the very moment you need it. It's an amazing truth that Paul lays out. My God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory. And that leads us to a super important verse or uh, truth, sorry, in our lives that we need to apply. And that truth is this. If we don't have it, we don't need it. And only after we really do have it do we know we need it, right? And that, that why? Because we talked about that's the way the Lord wants us to walk, by faith. And you don't know what you need sometimes. He knows us better than we do. Do you know how many hairs are on your head? He does. That just speaks of the intimacy of how he knows your heart and your mind. He knows what you need before you do. If we don't have it, we don't need it. And that's something Angela and I try to instill in our kids. You know, uh, my son, Caden, he'll be three at the end of October. And uh, he has, an, it, DNA is weird, right? Because <laughs> he has inherited from his grandmother an affinity for cookies. He loves them like no other kid I've ever seen. And his grandma loves them like no woman I've ever seen. She loves her cookies. If there are not cookies at Phil and Cindy's house, the Lord is coming that day. For sure. There will always be cookies. I count on it. And Caden sees our houses the same way. There better be cookies. Because he needs it. I remember... Uh, months ago Angela had gone on Thursday she does our shopping for the house well we were out of cookies and so she bought a pack of mega stuffed cookies and I stayed away from them for a whole week I was very proud of myself well the following Friday comes around and I'm having a cheat meal that day and it's going to be for dinner looking forward to some Thai food right and I'm on, I am starving because I didn't eat that day at work. And I know that, oh my gosh, I cannot wait to get my cheat meal. But I'm going to kick off that cheat meal with two mega stuff Oreos dipped in uh, peanut butter. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if you, side note, if you don't put your Oreos in peanut butter, you're missing out. I'm telling you, it's got to be creamy. Get that crunchy out of here. Very important that we, that's a truth. So anyways, I'm on my way home. I'm starving. And I'm like, I'm going to kick off this cheat meal with two Oreos. I'm, I gave way too much thought into this as I'm driving home. I'm just thinking about these Oreos. I knew, because I gave Caden one for dessert the night before, that there was four left in there. And I knew there's no way that kid ate four during the day. So I'm like, I'm having two come home I walk up the stairs no shower no washing the hands I get my boots off I am just I'm going right to the stove because that's where the cookies are sitting I see the package sitting there I pick it up it's a little light and I'm thinking who would put an empty Oreo bag back on the stove 
demonic people? I mean, who, who does? Like, that's like putting an empty milk cart back in the fridge. Guess what? We don't need it anymore. It's old. So I'm like, no, no. My head's just going. I open it up, and there's nothing in there. All of a sudden, I hear, Dad, you're home. He comes running down the hall, the you know pitter-patter of his feet, and he looks at me. There was just Oreo kicked all around his face. And I said, boy, did you eat the Oreos? And he goes, mom was putting Greg right down for sleep, and I ate the Oreos. Yeah. He does not lie. You could bust that kid, and he's like, totally did it. He took a purple marker one day, drew all over our brand-new couch. I said, son, did you do that? He goes, yeah, with this. He does not. He ain't a liar. He'll just take the punishment. He's good. But talking about that principle, if we don't have it, we don't need it. Constantly, I would, I, we tell our kids, Dad, there's no more juice. Oh, you got water and you got milk. You don't need it. You know? And he looked at me. I said, did you eat the Oreos? Yeah. Guess you don't need it. And I was like, oh. I wanted to throttle him. You ever wanted to throttle a two-year-old? No. With love. I wanted to hug him. What a, what a basic truth, though, right? If we don't need it, or if we don't have it, or if we don't need it, we don't have it. The Lord will give it to us if you need it. We know that, and we know that is the truth, because it says there, our God will provide all our needs according to his riches and glory. The eighth and final thing that we're going to look at in light of having joy and giving to others involves greetings. Super simple. And it's going to be in verses 21 through 23. Look at it again with me. It says, verse 21, greet every saint in Jesus Christ. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are in Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord, I don't know if you caught that, especially those who are in Caesar's household. He's in a prison in Rome. And he's like, yeah, by the way, Caesar, there's Christians in your house, you idiot. He's getting them back. It's a little dig. I like it from Paul. 23 says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So joy in giving not only in giving to others not only involves what we give to others, but how we give to others as we greet others. Simple, I know, but we got to note carefully that in verse 23, what it was that Paul was giving to the church in Philippi there. He said what? Grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The word grace is used 156 times in the New Testament, and it means unmerited favor or getting what we don't deserve. And the big point, the big picture here is that here, here is Paul having joy in giving grace to the Philippians. And he was giving them what they didn't deserve. The grace of Jesus, we don't deserve it, but he gave it. It's very easy, isn't it, church, to give to somebody when they're deserving? If you have kids, you, they get a good report card. It's very easy to go, we're going out for ice cream, dude. Good job. You did good. When somebody does a really good job on your lawn, and, oh, man, they put the lines in perfectly. It looks like a baseball field. They crisscrossed them. Full dad mode. You know what I mean? Here's an extra 20. Good job. Like, when somebody does well, it's really easy to extend that grace. And, oh, here you go. It's really easy to give to them. What about the reverse of that? When somebody doesn't deserve that, how do we treat them? Uh, well, I had to ask twice for them to refill my soda at dinner, so that's going to reflect in the tip. Are you kidding me? Get over it. Pay the people. They're having a hard day. It's really easy to show that when people are deserving. It's not so easy. But what about the grace? When you remember that you've been given much, we are to give it back, right? And the application is simple. We should, we should have and are called to have the same joy, church, the same joy in giving to others whether they deserve it or whether they do not. Because the joy is on our end, because we're giving. 
through Christ, regardless of who the recipient is. And when we look at our lives in light of that, there is joy. Because we're not basing it off of that person or their works. We're basing it off of the fact that Jesus is who he said he is. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he does not change. And that's where we find our contentment. And so, like Paul says in verse 23, I say amen. And amen means I agree or let it be, right? So let's pray. Lord, please help us to have the heart that we agree that this is how we should live our lives. Giving to others and having joy in doing so no matter who they are, no matter what the need may be, and no matter what state we are in. We thank you that we can praise you no matter what state we're in because you are faithful and you do not change. And we can be content in who you are and confident that you are who you say you are. Lord, help us to look for those times where we can share with others. We thank you that when we do so, give through sacrifice, that there is a benefit to our account in heaven, that we can give it back to you when we see you there. Lord, we thank you for providing for our greatest need in the sending of your son. Thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.